U.S. and North Central. That's uh, okay. So in the North Central Oklahoma, there's a, a the Department of Energy has a long-term climate research station there, which has a tall tower. Uh, and so that's where the head of the red arrow is located, right, where we have a lot of wind generation. So I just randomly picked a day out there that happened to have a large uh, wind ramp event right there at circled in cyan. And so we're showing in black the observations and in the different color lines are different forecasts initialized at different times. And so one of the things you can see is in version four that very quickly at the 6Z forecast that was on the 10th, you know, so it was over 30 hours out, actually identified that wind ramp event very accurately, both the timing of it, the intensity of the drop of, in the wind. Whereas in version three, version three really did not notice the wind ramp event until you got much closer to the event, maybe about 18 hours in duration uh, ahead, maybe it, it noticed it, but it didn't really get the magnitude or the timing of it right. And so what, was, what we're hearing is, anecdotally from various partners, such as uh, Gunnar Schaefer out at the Southwest Power Pool, that uh, the HER version four is doing a much better job capturing wind ramp events. And so here's one example from their decision-making thing. Uh, the green curve is actually the HER prediction model. The other curves are other uh, weather forecast models, some internal, some outside that they use in their decision-making process. You can see it captured that ramp event very nicely. Here's another example where it even did better you know, looking out over 24 hours and the, the green curve captured that wind event very nicely. So this is one of the successes. We're working with uh, some colleagues now to actually quantify how well we're actually doing on the wind ramp stuff, but, uh, you know, that's work in progress. From a solar energy perspective, clouds are the, the challenge, you know, for primarily. That's the $50 challenge, getting the clouds right. And in particular, in any model grid cell you have, you're gonna have variability in moisture. And so in some areas, you're gonna have some regions of supersaturation and some subsaturation. And if you have supersaturation regions, like you're seeing in the upper right-hand plot there, you should actually be able to form a subgrid scale cloud, like a fair weather cumulus, perhaps. It's a huge challenge for all numerical modeling systems, both climate and weather. And we've really been working on how to improve the representation of these types of clouds. And you can sort of see it from the satellite image on the left, I'm pointing out two different regions. Uh, in particular, you can see off the, the coast of California, there's a, a big stratocumulus deck there. In version four, it's much better represented. Version three has very little cloud there off the coast of California. You can also see the cloud systems up over South Dakota, how there's much better represented. Not perfect, we're still working on that, but it's much better in version four than version three. And you can see the impact on the solar radiation bias is that we've reduced it well over half. Now, we still have a significant solar radiation bias that we're working on, uh, and this is you know, work that's continuing to, to go. We did add smoke to version four of the HER. This has been some research that's been many years in coming. Um, the challenge with running an NWP model operationally uh, in the weather service is that you have to be still computationally efficient. So we were able to model the smoke as a single tracer, which had a small computational cost. And we were able to integrate that. It became operational at the Weather Service in December of 2020. And as I indicated before, that smoke particles actually does interact with the radiation. And so it does affect the solar radiation at the surface, which can affect the temperature at the surface too. It also has an air quality component to it. We predict how much uh, particulate mass you're gonna see at the surface. And so in the bottom right plot, you can actually see the impact on the visibility there where higher values in red, especially on the August 5th, August 6th, August 7th period, much higher than you're seeing in red with the smoke than you were seeing without the smoke in blue. And so those are some marked increases in, in the skill of the model in getting the visibility and you would see the same thing on the shortwave radiation. Now, where are we going? Uh, the HER model is actually running in operations right now, but version four is the last version of that particular modeling system. NOAA is moving toward a unified forecast system, the UFS. Part of this is going to use a dynamic core. The dynamic core is sort of the heart of any sort of uh, weather prediction model that advects material around, whether that material is smoke or water vapor or temperature or whatever. And so we're, we're working on using the new core that's been adopted, the FD3 core. And actually the global forecast system moved to using the FD3 you know, dynamic core back in 2019. We're, built, we're building this rapid refreshed forecast system, the RUFUS. Uh, we like to pronounce every acronym if we can. 
uh, which is going to replace the her. And you can see the timing here. In the blue, you can see five or six different lines going across. Those are all regional, uh, regional scale NWP models. So there's various components that we need to add to this. Um, so some of the design elements in order to replace all those regional models is we need to have a much larger domain. And so you can see the Rufus model itself, it's, it's gonna be a three kilometer model. It's actually gonna cover most of North America. So a significantly larger domain than what we were covering with the HER. We're actually gonna increase the vertical resolution of the, uh, of the model by about a factor of two, which should help us with replacing uh, and representing some of the clouds. And in our model physics, in our initial version is gonna use the HER physics. So it's the physics package we've been developing for the last you know, 15 years, and we're gonna continue moving in that direction as we integrate it into this modeling system. Uh, other features of this real quick is we're you know, continuing to do the hourly restarting. Uh, forecasts going beyond 48 hours, the current uh, horizon is for 60 hour forecasts, but we're gonna assimilate all different sorts of data, just like what we're doing with the, the HER. We've actually working with an improved uh, data assimilation method. It's sort of a three kilometer storm scale ensemble data assimilation method. The cartoon wiring diagram is quite complicated in the upper right. If you care to stare at it for 30 minutes, you might be able to figure it out. Uh, we continue to work on our coupling of the land surface with the, the atmosphere itself. That's really important for both clouds and uh, wind. Um, we're doing uh, data simulation of cloud observations also, uh, which is uh, currently a non-variational approach, but we're working to improve it. And of course, there's a lot of post-processing you can do with any sort of output from an NWP model. Uh, for example, diagnosing uh, wind gust potential and other things like that. And then probably for this community, something really important is the Rufus is going to be an ensemble prediction system. And so I'm giving you an example here where uh, there's nine members of which seven of them are predicting a severe weather event that actually agreed pretty well with the observations. We need to start doing some evaluation of this from a renewable energy point of view and how well does the ensemble capture, you know, for example, uh, ramp events, be it solar ramp events or, or wind ramp events. So uh, kind of in summary, uh, version four uh, uh, became operational uh, back in December of 2020. Longer forecast, lots of improvements to the data simulation and the physics. Working on Rufus now, which will replace the HER you know, in uh, fiscal year 24. Continuing to focus on the entire atmosphere surface system. It's a really a holistic approach. Continuing to do campaigns to help us collect data sets to do this. In particular, a campaign we're, we're organizing right now is the Wind Forecast Improvement Project number three, which is an offshore wind energy experiment south of Martha's Vineyard. Uh, we are looking at the HER forecast for dynamic line rating applications. Um, and for, if you would like more information, over the last sort of 18 months, we've really worked hard to get more papers to describe this modeling system that have been either published or are currently in press, looking at its components, its evaluation, its economic impact. In particular, there was a paper just published a, a couple of weeks ago in the Journal of Sustainable and Renewable Energy showing uh, if you used new versions of the HER, it, could, it was, could save people hundreds of millions a year. So it might be interesting for you. So with that, I'll just stop and uh, we'll move on. Thank you. Great, thank you, Dave. It's very interesting. So I, I think we'll hold questions until the very end, if that's okay. And I'll proceed on with our next uh, speaker. Uh, Brady Cowistaw is a senior engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. She works on topics concerning grid evolution and integration of renewable and flexible technologies, predominantly through capacity expansion, production cost modeling of future power systems. And she's going to talk about uh, long duration storage on high PV systems for us. Thank you. Thanks. Well, yeah, I'm excited to talk to y'all today about some work that we've been starting and will continue for the next uh, two years, at least looking at long duration storage and really the impact of um, high penetration systems, high PV and high wind, and what is the impact of modeling on those systems and what forecasting can, uh, what the impacts of forecasting can be. 
So most of y'all, I assume, are aware today of long duration storage is impacted largely by the market structures, which tend to be day ahead commitment um, the day before, and then unit or dispatch in the real time, um, some period ahead of time. While this is formalized in market structures, even other types of utilities tend to have similar operating practices. Really what this lets happen is storage can look one to two days out, see what's necessary on the grid and operate accordingly. This works great for diurnally operation, di diurnally operated storage where you really only are doing, you know, day shifting to nighttime or something like that. However, long duration storage really needs a farther ahead um, time period in order to optimize its full value. So we see here um, this first day, these first two days, January 4th and 5th, this is on a, um, a system we were analyzing that was 100% renewable energy uh, and really high penetrations of solar. So you really get to see that strong diurnal pattern, you know, fill up the storage during the day, cycle it at night, fill up the storage of the day, cycle it at night. There is some longer duration storage on this system. However, it's typically only being operated at that time scale because that's what it sees. However, once we start to move again towards these high penetration systems, you know, not necessarily 100%, but approaching 100% even, you really start to have advantages from operating your long duration storage, what we define here as eight to 24 hours. I know that there's, as Nate pointed out, a lot of questions around what counts as long duration, but that's what I mean for this presentation. Uh, you have a lot of ad advantages if you can actually see farther out than just the next 24 hours or even the next 48 hours. So for this, the thing that we're missing is actually this little period here, which was a cold front coming through that then led to a lot of cloud cover, not a lot of solar, followed by really high demand in an area that had high uh, electric heating. So if you are a storage operator of long duration storage on these first two days, you would expect that, you know, we look at the weather forecast say, hey, there's great um, incentive for me to fully fill up my storage, hold some back, not operate diurnally while I can, and then take advantage of my long duration storage during that key period of time, you would do that. But there's not necessarily either the market structures in place today, but also the modeling structures to capture this and really understand what the benefits are when you're looking at deploying long duration storage. So when does this start to matter? Uh, this is all research that's been previously done by our team members. So I'll point you to the two um, citations down below. But really what we've seen is this starts to matter at in particular greater than 50% of uh, renewable shares. And in particular, greater than 75%, it becomes very high value to have longer duration storage on your system being able to operate this. So we have a lot of uh, both states as well as utilities in the United States moving towards 100% or you know, 80 or 75% uh, renewable energy goals. And so we really think that this will start to become more and more important as we transition towards this high renewable future. So historically though, it's been really hard to model long duration storage. And so it's hard to capture, um, I think Nate mentioned this, of when and how is long duration storage actually valuable to the grid? So that's the main question that our group is trying to answer is, how do we actually capture this in our modeling so that we can show the value and understand when and when and how and what are the most important values here for long duration storage when we talk about um, both dispatching it and the forecasting that you need in order to understand its value. So the first method that people have used is looking at state of change uh, targets. So saying at the end of a particular period, we want to tell the system to reach this particular uh, state of charge. And so uh, usually this will have some sort of what we call a medium term simulation that's at a reduced resolution to create these targets. And so that uh, can be problematic depending on the timelines to do that. And you might miss some key aspects in that reduced resolution. Next is looking at longer optimization periods. So instead of having just your day ahead unit commitment and then real time, you might look two days advance or three days in advance and include that longer optimization period over your whole um, simulation. The challenge with this is usually people set this up in order with perfect forecasts. And so then you have too much information and too good of an idea of what's happening that's unrealistic. The final one that people have tried is looking at something called an energy value. So putting an explicit value in your optimization 
for keeping energy in your storage facility. And, and so this might range from something as low as a dollar per megawatt hour, just to really kind of poke people in the right direction, or it might be really high depending on um, what, what, is, what are the other generators on your system and what storage is kind of competing with. So the challenge here is it's really hard to come up with a global idea here and you really go back and forth based on the system. So we wanted to, in starting to test this out, we used a five bus test system that's kind of shown here with all the, oops, with the um, different nodes and lines. Each of the nodes has some combination of wind, um, thermal generation, solar load or storage. And so we included all of these just to let us test out some of these different methodologies and start poking around at what happens when you um, change your optimization as well as do and don't have forecasting errors and what does that do for your long duration storage we did this modeling with a um, open source production cost model called sip that enrol developed if you're interested in checking it out more there's a little link right there uh, and looked at four or three different scenarios with pre curtailment penetrations of both wind and solar of 30 percent 45 percent and 60 percent we term these just the 30, 45, and 60 RE scenarios for shorthand. But again, these are pre-curtailment numbers of both types of generation. And then we added both a 10 and a 24 hour battery to the system to look at the difference if, if you are um, a shorter long duration storage versus a longer long duration storage. Uh, so the first thing that we notice is Similar to previous work, the impact of long duration storage increases at higher variable penetrations. So as you move from 30% to 60%, um, one, we see a reduction in cost just because you have more renewable energy. But then what this is showing is the two different tables are the 10 hour storage um, simulations and the 24 hour storage with increasing optimization periods. So we started diving into that kind of middle option um, that I showed a couple slides ago. So we start with the standard 24 hours and then increase our optimization time to 72 hours and increase it again to 168 hours or a week. So really with 10 hour storage, you do see an improvement when you look farther ahead, but you see much more of an improvement when you have the 24 hour storage device, really because that is operating less and less diurnally um, looking and you can get much more benefit out of it if you are operating it in a non-diurnal manner. And so being able to see farther ahead is really impactful. The problem with this, as I stated previously, is that these were all done with perfect foresight. So um, that's not necessarily how we actually operate a system. So next we wanted to look at what happens when we add forecast error. Um, one of the key things that we noticed though is that we want to be able to see system stress. So to cut to the chase a little bit, really the times of system stress were the most impactful for storage. And so what we did is we removed two thermal units from the 45% and 60% scenarios in order to create times that there was unserved energy. Again, this is just a test system. Hopefully we're not in general designing our grids to drop load, but um, we did it in this case for uh, research reasons. We did find that forecasting errors didn't have a significant impact on the overall metrics when we did this. So it had less than 1% of an impact on like total production cost and curtailment, but the impacts as you'll see in the next slide were much more significant when we were looking at those periods of reliability need. Um, so again, it's the two tables of 10 hour storage and 24 hour storage first with perfect foresight uh, and how much unserved energy we had during those two times, and then the increase when we included forecast errors of either a systematic 8% over forecast or a systematic 8% under forecast. And you see that certainly I would say the, the numbers themselves, I wouldn't put any particular stake on, but really the key message here is that forecasting does matter in your reliability context. And so we want to be able to understand, one, getting forecasts better would be great. That sounds wonderful. Um, so we certainly appreciate all the work that NOAA is doing to improve their forecast. But also, when we are operating our batteries and our long duration storage devices, really keeping this in mind when we're coming up with our operational um, schemes and how we look at the optimization of those storage units, understanding what the forecasting errors are and taking that into account can impact your reliability much more than it can your total production cost or metrics like that. 
Um, the last thing that we looked at is cycling, um, since I know this is of interest to storage operators and how much are you actually cycling, cycling your battery, how much are you draining it? Um, and those are key metrics that they like to keep in mind. Uh, so we did find that including forecast errors both increase the amount of cycling that you have as well as the number of hours that the storage spent empty. And so these can be, again, things to keep in mind when operating your storages. The main takeaways that I have are one, long duration storage will become increasingly important for the uh, variable renewable grids that we expect to see in the future. So it's important to get a handle on this. Standard modeling methods tend to underrepresent the value of long duration storage. We don't fully capture with most current methods how much long duration storage could actually impact the grid and in particular could impact those times of reliability. And then finally, really the key for long duration storage is its impact on these reliability needs, less so the larger scale kind of annual impacts. So um, this is kind of the start of a three-year project and we hope to continue it with more real systems than a five bus test system. So um, hopefully in the future, we'll have uh, more interesting results that are really diving into closer to real world systems than a little test bus. But we did find that this was a pretty interesting start to the research. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Brady. Uh, very fascinating. Next, we're going to uh, turn uh, our attention over to uh, Dr. Nick Ingerer, who's going to be joining us uh, remotely from Australia, from Soulcast. And uh, Nick, if you're able to um, share your screen when you can. <clears throat> Nick, I think you're on mute, uh, but I'll go ahead. Get it all going, guys. Yeah, that was a, that was a quick finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Uh, can you guys see me as well? And here. Yep, we can see you. Um, yep. All right. And, and the uh, slides are looking good. You don't see anything yet. No. <laughs> ah, okay. Let's try again. While you uh, while you pull that up, I'll go ahead and introduce you, Nick. Um, so. Dr. Nick Ingerer is the Chief Technology Officer at, and co-founder of Solcast, a global solar irradiance and power forecasting data company uh, dedicated to helping you build the solar power future. Uh, Nick holds a PhD in solar uh, radiation modeling and forecasting and has managed a portfolio of more than $5.4 million in applied R&D funding, where he enjoys leading teams focused on bridging the gap between science and technology. Thanks for that intro. How are we doing with the slides now? I've restarted. See, we can see them now. Thanks, Nick. Okay. All right. Well, lovely to be virtually presenting to you all. Apologies in advance for the poor camera angle. I'm working from home this morning, and you might even hear the kids in the background. We're getting ready for school at the moment. So it's an exciting morning here in Australia. Uh, would have been lovely to be with you guys all in the United States. Just didn't work out this time around. And I appreciate the accommodations. Thank you, Craig. So yeah, I think my title is a bit sweeping. I gave it quite a long time ago. Um, and I, I wouldn't promise to offer a complete view of all the updates in solar PV now casting. But what I do want to show is just some examples of how it's being used around the world. Uh, that's something that I think is really fun. I always find that very interesting myself um, to see real examples of how these uh, technologies that are being discussed are being applied. And that's what we'll focus on today. And in particular, one of the things I wanted to start off was talk about this concept of now casting, because it's not necessarily always a familiar term outside of the weather forecasting industry. And uh, it sits in the space between traditional NWP forecasts uh, over there on the right. And what, what, on our team, we called our estimated actuals, that just meaning like actual data. So the gap between present time and when you're getting data out of NWP, traditional NWP models, not something like the HER, which we heard about two presentations ago. Um, we have a gap of a period of time, somewhere between, uh, it's on the scale of tens to hundreds of minutes of time. But we're not getting new update information from weather models. Uh, and, and we're not able to persist the present values that we have in real time forward with enough accuracy. So we have this gap in between that we call the now casting horizon. And that's increasingly encompassing things like precipitation, as well as cloud cover and wind speed, which we talk about in the renewables space. 
And this problem is a really unique one because it's not necessarily one that is it's settled on how we will approach that problem. So there's different techniques for producing operational forecasts in the nowcast horizon. And uh, one of my team members made a simplified version of a, this slide, which is actually adapted from um, a publication that's about 12 years old now. Uh, but the, the general idea here is that as you look at spatial resolution and temporal resolution, when you go out those axes, this is where you get into the most valuable area for MWP assistance in terms of forecasting. It's where you get the most skill out of it. Uh, when you come back down to shorter time scales and small spatial resolutions, this is where statistical models work really well. Statistical models, regressive models, for example, machine learning, tend to work really well for a single site or a small area over short periods of time. The really interesting thing that I like about this graph is it it's giving us a perspective of what's actually possible with satellite-based forecasting, particularly with the advent of the third generation weather satellites like GO-16, for example, GO-17, um, and Himawari 8, which we're using in Australia. And it, we can capture time scales of um, a few hours of cloud movement. Really, it depends how, how well you can do that depends on the day and how dynamic the cloud conditions are. But you can spatially capture that information on the order of thousands of kilometers or more. So we can really see a whole picture of the whole weather system evolving. And that is the sweet spot. That's the spot that we've applied the technology over the last several years to scale up global forecasting coverage, to have a single system that covers all the clouds around the world and does solar forecasting for everywhere. Um, the scalable solution there is to use weather satellites with some information from NWP. Um, and so what we end up doing is we end up blending information from both these in application at Solcast. So pulling in the information from the weather satellites, where clouds are, their previous positions, tracking them over time and updating information, but pulling in valuable information from NWP, such as the float fields in the atmosphere, which heights of the atmosphere, um, what is the, the wind shear, what is the direction of the wind, what is the speed of the wind at different heights in, in the troposphere where clouds are forming and moving and where all of weather is happening, is some very valuable information. So we can see clouds and satellites, we can have an idea where they might go next based on NWP flow fields, and we can merge that information together and, and to create semi-dynamical nowcasting and, and moving clouds around and seeing where we think they'll go next. And not only that, because we're getting satellite information every five, 10 minutes or so, we can be continually updating those forecasts and even actually dynamically improving them. And so what this ends up meaning is we start seeing, and this is just an example, it's an illustrative example, it doesn't refer to a particular day necessarily, but it starts to get into some of these questions and, and even illustrations from the two previous speakers around capturing ramp events, uh, knowing what's gonna happen with variable renewable energy in a really valuable way. Whereas NWP, which is giving us, with the exception of really high resolution models like the HER, is giving us hourly, three hourly updates. Um, it's giving us a coarse picture of what's happening. We're not getting explicit cloud resolution. We're using um, cloud parameterizations, but again, that's done on a pretty big scale. And we're not getting any really finite information about what's gonna happen with individual cloud cover or um, even cloud decks in a particular region. And so the difference here is that when we start doing now casting, we actually gain back the ability to really truly authentically forecast and predict ramping events with clouds, which are very important. And this is a solar example, but the same thing can be said of wind, which again, is why it's so important to be able to get into those time scales and spatial scales that the satellite forecasting does so well with. And so what we also then do is then take the cloud information, um, the dynamic, semi-dynamical now casting system I was referring to before, we're vecting clouds with the wind fields from the weather models, um, but we're also not just taking one forecast, we're taking many forecasts. We're moving clouds a bit slower, a bit faster, persisting them, um, having clouds move in different directions at different levels of the troposphere, just to capture some of the uncertainty that exists in, in weather. And so this example here is just showing actual cloud opacity over the UK on the left, and um, an ensemble forecast on the right, which is getting a bit fuzzier over time because you're seeing the disagreement from different models show up as the forecasting horizon goes out to two hours ahead. This type of approach means we can start to also add uncertainty into the modeling for the semi-dynamical now casting approaches with satellites because we can use some of those approaches that we use even in weather model analysis. Um, we had a great example of different runs from the HER showing where we would have a severe weather event happen 
that's how we get consensus in weather forecasting. And the same thing applies to renewable energy forecasting and increasingly in the operational setting, in control rooms, um, in the energy market operator, and ISO control rooms, they're increasingly using multiple models. They've been doing this for years, but it's increasingly the status quo so that uncertainty is represented, multiple vendors, multiple models. We need to capture this uncertainty. It's a really big, important part of establishing an operating envelope, doing things like effectively operating storage from the examples we just saw. And then baking that all together in one system, I think is a really exciting thing. It's one of the things we've done at SoulCast that I'm quite proud of, which is being able to have this data updating in real time all around the world at one to two kilometers. And we get to really see when this example here from the US uh, just a few weeks ago, you can watch the weather happening and you can see the satellites give us this really rich information and then mapping it into the space of global horizontal radius like you see in this and making that available through an operational system so we can pull that data out anywhere. Now that that's pretty cool. It makes for a nice picture, but the applications for that are what are really exciting. So. Um, the thing I wanted to show you guys an example of an action today is this concept that we have as whole cast of grid aggregations. And these graphics are meant to help walk you through. They're not just pretty, they're meant to kind of capture a concept, which is being able to model individual solar systems, whether they're rooftop or they're commercial scale or they're industrial scale, and model each of them individually according to the cloud conditions from that gridded system but then aggregate their collective power output to the level at which the decision-making needs to happen. That might be by a market region or postcode regions or whatever a utility wants to work with on the left, or it can go to the network. We can look at entire regions. You can do regions within an ISO, an entire ISO. You can do distribution lines by themselves, transmission zone areas. The flexibility is incredible. It really comes down to what the application is needed for. And then this allows us to get an idea of all the solar assets at a given uh, part of the, 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 the network hierarchy and give the solar forecast back in that context. So I'll give you two examples of that in action. One is in Taiwan. Um, Taiwan holds a special place in my heart. I, I love going to Taiwan, been there several times, um, have some friends there. And um, I'm really, really excited that we've taken on Thai Power as, as a client because it gives us an opportunity to work in a really dynamic, challenging forecast environment um, with lots of solar. And so uh, you know, Taiwan, I think last I was looking at our last forecast, but they're generating the summer somewhere around four gigawatts of solar from a mixture of utility scale and rooftop sources. But then that's really, you know, the, the grid operator wants that information at a fairly fine scale. So we're just showing you some county level um, examples of some solar installations from Thai Power's website. But actually what we do is we model all of the, the, the island of Taiwan, and then we create those grid aggregations all the way down to the level of their network and regions they care about. So there's actually over 300 unique grid aggregations that we're running for them, which we can then mix and match and sum up in any way that they need um, according to what decisions they need to make for their network. And this is really a, quite an interesting case because Taiwan exists in a, a very a warm uh, climate where there's a very humid, wet summers, there's almost a wet, a monsoonal wet season happening they don't really get a, too much of a dry season. It's kind of, it would kind of rain all year round really in Taiwan. Um, but that's the main reason for that is because they have exceptional orographic lift, big mountain regions right down the center. And so it's been a really challenging place to try to nail convection and do forecasting and um, has been something that has been uh, a real fun thing to do. I'm looking at things like the applications for the wharf model, um, for example, to see if we can get a mesoscale model to help us with additional information and blend that into the satellite data, uh, not dissimilar from the discussions from our from our first member of the panel. And um, what allows us, this technique allows us to do is give a picture of all of the solar around Taiwan, forecast that forward into the future, which in this example, you see this banded region giving us uncertainty. And one of the reasons I really like this example is the day ahead on this one, um, in May, to have ramping up uh, cloud cover and more graphic lift and even some thunderstorming, we can see there's a lot of uncertainty in what's gonna happen tomorrow. And that makes things like orchestrating storage challenging. And it also makes the need to update that forecast in real time with the satellite data, uh, really, really an important use case for the tech. You can look back the day before at the dotted line there, that's the estimated actuals of what actually happened. We get a nice little warming up, clear day, in come the clouds and down ramps the energy through the afternoon. Uh, same sort of thing happening in the example in front of you where the latest estimates line is separating the forecast from, from the um, most recent conditions. 
updating this in real time is really um, a, quite a challenge and is an important one. And then you get fun things like this. I couldn't resist putting this slide in. Uh, my team member, Alistair, said, we got to show this one. I totally agree. This is just the example of the solar eclipse from June 2020, where you can see them ramp off right there in the, in the time series um, on the right. And then the video on the left, I'll play one more time. You see some cloud and convection getting started coming across the island. And then late afternoon, all of a sudden, we get the ramp down from the sun going behind the moon, which is about the biggest ramp event you can get. Thankfully, it can be perfectly forecast. Now, just moving on with one more example, and I will be brief here because I know time is short. I wanted to show you um, a really, really interesting thing that's happening in Australia. I've talked about this place before. It's South Australia. That's the state we have the arrow pointing at there. The star is Adelaide, which I'll then reference in the next slide so you get an idea of the very major population center. It has so much rooftop solar. Um, areas with 60 to 70% penetration of rooftop solar are common. And in fact, when put all together, over a gigawatt of rooftop solar, it's, that is the biggest generation source in South Australia. There's no, there's no bigger power plant than that. And really fascinatingly, what's happening is we are seeing increasing numbers, particularly in the spring and the autumn, of days where almost the entire demand in South Australia is met by rooftop solar. So that yellow graph, um, in our previous presentation, we had rooftop solar was a small sliver. And this one, rooftop solar is the big one. Uh, this is a incredible thing to see, to see you know, 1.2, 1.3 gigawatts of rooftop solar servicing almost an entire state by itself. It's on an interconnection to other states nearby. Um, but you can see we've got negative prices showing up. What does this mean for gas generators that uh, keep operating during this period? They're losing money. Um, do we even have too much wind in this situation? This isn't every day, but this is increasingly common in terms of a type of day that we're having in South Australia. And it really makes it one of the forefronts for understanding what high penetration renewables and forecasting really mean when put into practice together. And so we're running that same forecasting system over South Australia. We've even put in some new improvements there, trying to capture cloud growth and decay, um, even capturing things like precipitation through a new system we built over the last two years called Cumulus. And in the applications that come out of this, we end up with a number of really rich examples to look at. And so this particular image here is showing you, um, I guess the, the image on the right there, the times scale thing um, that shows the legend that shows us things. Here we go, is blocked by my own image. There we are. Um, the black line is the estimated actual. So that's what actually happened with rooftop solar generation on that day. The, and then we're getting an idea of what the forecast one hour ahead of was with the blue line, two hours ahead with the green line. And then interestingly, again, the NWP based 24 hours ahead with the red line. It's just like the example we saw before. We don't really see that ramp ahead of time. It starts to shape up. We start to see that there's a chance of a ramp with the two hour ahead. The one hour ahead really starts to pick it up and get the timing right. And it, in this example, the closer you get to 10 minutes ahead, 15 minutes ahead, the more agreement we get with the forecasting system and the actual event. And so this type of updating forecast is really critical for a place like South Australia. You can't just stick with the NWP. You can't just stick with the two hour ahead. You need to be looking at an update every 10 minutes because that's how quickly the system can change. And with that much rooftop solar, you really got to get that right because that's a that's that's not synchronous generation. Um, that, there's, that is uh, not a robust power supply to be running the entire state off of inverters. It's something that um, we really need to take good care with to make the renewable future succeed. Um, just a quick one at the end, but you can't resist splashing up a few of the clients. Uh, we've got an increasing number of people using these now casting um, applications, uh, including our own grid operator here in Australia, who are part of the project that I was just showing you before in South Australia. That's really uh, exploring and discovering some exciting things. And I love venues like this because we get to talk about that here from all over the world. It's a lot to take on. It's hard to take us all the way from what is now casting to some real applications that um, and can be of use to some of you pros out there. But of course, very happy to continue the conversation as we share learnings and make sure we keep building our renewable powered future. Thanks so much, guys. That was lovely to present to you. Um, you can reach me at nick at soulcast.com. Well, hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here after a four hour flight uh, over the most of America. Uh, so we have the final session of the day, which comprises two panels. The uh, both of those panels are about 
initiatives that DOE took over the last uh, few years. The first one is pretty recent. It's about the solar forecasting prize, the first of its kind that uh, we run uh, this, uh, this spring. Um, I wanna say a few words here. It was announced by Secretary Granholm uh, at SPI back uh, in September last year. The main thing here is to promote the development and the use of probabilistic forecasting tools. The idea was to have uh, the participants um, submit forecasts every day for 28 days from February 14 to March 13 at 10 locations around the US. And this would be uh, day ahead forecasts of hourly um, resolution. We would use the solar forecast arbiter to evaluate those forecasts and the participants would also uh, submit a conservation plan um, for a review. Uh, the best of the best would get uh, $50,000 each. Uh, we would award about five of those awards and we would also have uh, runners up uh, $25,000 for each of the runners up. Uh, here's the, uh, the final list of winners. Uh, these are in uh, alphabetical order, so don't try to um, get anything more uh, out of this other than uh, who, who the names are. And we also have the runners up uh, at the bottom of the list. The DOE awarded uh, $300,000 for uh, all these prizes. Uh, this is my last slide for the introduction. And here you see the competitors, about 18 competitors. 18 competitors, these are the, the rows in the spreadsheet. And in the columns, you'll see the 10 locations where these competitors uh, ran the forecasts for. And what I'm counting here is how many days out of the 28, they beat the benchmark. The, ben the benchmark was the persistence ensemble uh, forecast. And you see here how you know, the group fared and you can uh, probably surmise who the best, uh, the best of those were. The, the reason I'm putting this on is just to uh, show that for three locations, right, Hawaii, uh, Washington State, and Florida, it was really hard for almost um, all of the uh, participants to get a good, a good forecast for. And that's just an interesting part. So without further ado, we'd like to go on the, um, the three pa participants, uh, sorry, the three panelists and Please, go ahead. So, Dr. Huang, uh, professor from uh, University of Michigan at Ann Arbor. Please. Yes, yes, please. Uh, go ahead. Uh, do, do I need to operate this? Or? Uh, probably you do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, uh, our team just consists of me and uh, uh, one research scientist in my group, Xiu Hongchen. So my group is specialized in the atmospheric radiation for its application in both the climate modeling and the remote sensing. And over the last several years, we, we took an interest in the machine learning as well. And this is really an opportunity for us to step into a new field to use all our uh, specialties there. So uh, in building this forecast approach, we are considering two facts there. The first fact is, I do not need to elaborate here. Basically the solar forecast is very much related to the weather and the particular for the cloud. And the second point is for any machine learning algorithm there, it would be most effective if you design and refine based on the guiding principle from physics rather than a, a blind trial there. Okay. And uh, based on those two considerations, we designed a hybrid forecast using the recursive neural network. And then we developed a empirical bias correction approach based on both the output from this RNN output and uh, the freely available weather forecast from the numerical weather prediction centers. And on the right, I just showed an example for one of the forecast set set and the black the black line is the actual observation and the yellow line with the green color there is our probability forecast and this is the forecast for the 24 to with the lead of 24 to 48 hours there and here i just summarized the out of the 10 set our 
performance there. And don't worry about the definition of this. It just say the, the smaller the number is, the better the prediction is. Okay. And so compared to the persistent model there, you can see our difference from the persistent model. And as just mentioned, for this Seattle set and the Florida set, we actually know better than the persistent models. And the we after the competition was done, we looked at a little bit carefully. And for the Seattle site, the problem is, is our empirical correction scheme. It's just not smart enough to do that correction. And for the Florida site, it's more like the cloud there. There are a lot of cloud developed within a day, the cumulus and the, the marine stratus cumulus. That's the big trouble there. And we also have a couple of sets which we can beat the, I'll say, outperform the persistent model considerably. And the interesting one is this California one, because California, you can see it's almost every day is clear sky. And the reason we can beat the persistent is just because there are three days that actually have almost overcast the situation there. And that's where we get some advantage in terms of the performance. And for the, the rest of the three sites I put here, it's really the, the, on the storm track. And basically we get the weather system right, that we get the evolution right, and the correction system works there. So I think this is my last slide. I will just stop here. Thank you. And we have uh, Jeff Calgon uh, from Nimbus AI for the next presentation. I want to mention something that's, I think, quite important. Uh, both Jeff and uh, uh, Shuang here, uh, Shangle, uh, they represent two of the five winners uh, from uh, our, our uh, prize competition. And I can share with you that uh, their models were the, the two best out of the five. There. So there's a good reason these guys are here. Yes. Okay, uh, so my name is Jeff. I'm with Nimbus AI. We're a small solar forecasting startup. Uh, there's currently four people. The, the modeling team for this prize was me and Peter Sadowski. Uh, Peter is a machine learning faculty at the University of Hawaii. Uh, so just a, a very quick remark on performance. Uh, the final model that we ended up with did perform much better than baseline persistence. Um, we were the only competitor which beat the baseline at every site, but it was highly variable, you know, as, as we just saw. And what I'm going to go into next is some of the lessons learned throughout the competition, some of which were surprising, at least to me. So the most important thing I want to stress is that whatever modeling approach you take for probabilistic forecasting, it has to be able to learn a rich variety of probability density functions. So just by means of illustration, that, that chart there is a, a histogram of cloud cover percentage at a location in Hawaii. And looking at that distribution, that's not a normal distribution. That's not a beta distribution. That's not even really a, a unimodal distribution. So really stressing whatever approach you take, it needs to learn a rich variety of density functions. What are some consequences of that? Um, one is that the real life dispersion characteristics don't really seem to be accurately captured by NWP ensemble approaches, at least with a small number of ensembles or ensemble members, say like 30 for the GEFS. Um, another aspect is that the uncertainty here is structured uncertainty, meaning that the density functions for each hour are not independent. You know, there's autocorrelation across time, there's covariance across space. So they're really joint density functions. So your modeling approach should take that into account as well. Uh, another learning was that whatever metric you use to do model selection, it should be a proper scoring metric. So we can talk more about that later if anyone's interesting, interested in it. The competition ended up using the CRPS, which is a proper scoring metric. Log likelihood is another one. Uh, final, just a quick remark. Remark, if you are using uh, NWP output variables as inputs to your model, be careful with the variable selection. <laughs> um, and a final remark that I just thought was interesting was naively one would think that clear sky models might be quite good at estimating clear sky irradiance conditions. 
uh, what we observed was that they were in fact very poor in certain geographies, but they were off by as much as 10%. So, you know, use care when using clear sky models as well. Uh, where are we taking this? Uh, we are gonna commercialize the day ahead probabilistic solar forecasting. So in a month or two, we'll, we'll launch a product where, you know, it's API based, you can select any location in the United States or more broadly the Americas or the Pacific and get that, you know, density function one day ahead. And we also have a, a now casting technology, which is a totally separate modeling approach, which is purely machine learning based. Um, that little animation there, the, the left is the actual satellite image for an hour over the island of, of Oahu and Hawaii, and the, the right is the our now casting model. So that's it for me. Thank you, Jeff. And now we'll have uh, David Larson from uh, EPRI. Thanks, Tasso. So uh, EPRI did not compete in this competition. We were involved helping running it, providing some support. I'm gonna be talking about the Solar Forecast Arbiter, which is the platform that was used to evaluate the forecasts. Um, just a quick background, Solar Forecast Arbiter, uh, Many of you may be aware of it, but if you're not, it's an open source platform. It was DOE funded, led by the University of Arizona. EPRI has been involved since the start, and EPRI is actually now going to be taking over stewardship of the, of the platform. Uh, one big feature of this, aside from being open source, is you can run multi-vendor anonymized trials. So the idea is rather than everyone doing their own evaluation, you have a central place to do that, and it's a fair comparison. Couple of notes just about how it performed, just to uh, thought were interesting is during the competition, over 1.3 million forecast data points. Uh, it handled the day ahead forecasts that were submitted by 18 participants. It was 10 sites, five time zones. These were day ahead schedules. They weren't exactly matching, for example, uh, specific ISO's uh, day ahead market, but they were similar to that of you're predicting the next day you submit in the morning for the following day. Did a bunch of other things. We were ingesting and validating the observations that were used to evaluate. We also were the ones producing the benchmark forecasts and also the daily reports that evaluated the performance. And all of this was done while still offering its normal features of over 200 sites being processed. So it worked well is the point. A couple of challenges and lessons learned for this. There were learning curves with this, um, partly because this competition was open to anyone. So there were people that were less on the commercialized side that maybe didn't have a full staff that, you know, they have software engineers on staff to handle everything. So there were some things we took away with that that will help in the future. There was the importance of choosing the forecast schedule of what are you ex actually evaluating and what's important uh, and having that reflect reality of what we really need. The other part was the value of the benchmark forecast. So we had a forecast that was a good baseline. One thing in all of this is making that more available and thinking about in the future. So we're really making the right comparisons. And the last part that I think this competition really showed is just the value of having these forecasts evaluated in sort of an operational setting. So it's not give me a year of historical forecast saying that's what I would produce, but actually say, no, the forecast has to be submitted by this time. If you miss that time, too bad, because that's what would happen in reality. If you don't get your forecast in time, that's on you. So those were things that we're going to be looking at and moving forward and improving. Uh, but again, we think it went very well. And lastly, just a couple of next steps. So we are working to improve the solar forecast arbiter uh, based on this competition, as well as two already done utility forecast trials. EPRI is taking over, um, and we'll be also launching a users group focused on industry. We do wanna be talking with a wide variety of people. So even if the users group is maybe more focused on utilities, we still wanna be talking with vendors, still be talking with researchers and really trying to think how can we move everything forward. Uh, third point, just to announce, I can't say the name of the utility today, but um, you'll be seeing things about a forecast trial with a large utility in the US Southeast. So we're doing another trial again, showing that this is being used and providing value. And the last thing that I think is really exciting is it's called the Solar Forecast Arbiter. It makes sense that it would be useful in other ways. So we're actually going to be generalizing and updating some things. So it's really clear you can do solar and you'll also be able to do wind power and load forecasting. Again, to really try to help the community with this. If you want more info, 
definitely happy to talk to anyone today. You can also reach out to me. Uh, Aiden Tui at EFRI is also involved, so you can always chat with him if you know him as well. And yeah, that covers what I wanted to cover. So thank you. Thank you, David. And thanks everyone on the panel. Uh, one thing I want to say, we at CIDO are very happy about how the arbiter turned out uh, and very happy that EPRI stepped up to continue the supporting the platform. And we're also going to be helping with uh, the, uh, the development of those, uh, no, those new features. But EPRI will support the operational um, cost for the, for the platform by themselves. So sort of forecasting to the program that we launched uh, back in uh, uh, 2016, actually. Uh, the program started, the project started performing in 2018 uh, and are just finishing. We had eight funded projects with about $15 million of uh, funding, including the cost share provided by the, uh, the awardees in three topic areas, uh, focusing on evaluation of forecasts, uh, improvement of radiation forecasts, and the improvement of probabilistic power forecasts. We believe that we have achieved the goals uh, in all three of those areas. Um, the Arbiter, as I mentioned, is uh, complete and uh, cloud ready and positioning to EPRI as we speak. We uh, saw up to 20% forecast scale uh, of the NAM from the probabilistic, sorry, from the uh, uh, irradiance forecasts. And we saw up to 40% a forecast scale of the precision ensemble uh, from some of our um, awardees in top area three. Uh, I won't stay here long. These are the 10 sites that uh, we had all awardees um, try and forecast. Actually, the topic area two uh, guys, these are the uranium's forecasts. They did a, a hindcast for 2018. And the topic area three folks, uh, they did. Uh, live forecast for three months over the same locations. That was in the fall of uh, 2021. Uh, just uh, some brief results here. These are the GHI skill scores for 2018 from Topic Area 2 guys, right? These are the irradiance models uh, from NRO, PNNL, um, Brookhaven, and uh, UCSD. Uh, you see the, the skill there up to 20% for UCSD. Now, PNNL. Um, they must the benchmark, but the reality there is that they just chose a very well-performing uh, benchmark. So um, nothing to take away from, from their model. And you see here the detailed results um, for both the references and uh, the, the models that were developed during the, uh, um, the, the project time. And these are the topic area three results. These are probabilistic forecasts, right? So you see here CRPS skill over the Precision ensemble forecast and same locations. We just have uh, nine out of the 10 here. And you see that uh, NRO uh, performed extraordinarily well uh, with uh, almost 45% skill uh, across the locations. Uh, EPRI performed pretty well as um, uh, too. Uh, John Scorpions, I think, did pretty well in DNI. Uh, the performance on GHI, I think, was a little marred by some operational issues, so that's why I'm not putting it up here. So without further ado, I want to bring up our uh, uh, panelists, and I don't know if Bry is hearing me, but I'll try to bring him up. All right, thanks so much, Tassos. Um, do you hear me all right? See the slides all right? We hear you pretty well. Please introduce yourself and you're good to go. Wonderful, thanks so much. Uh, I'm Brian Mathias Hodge. Um, I led the Topic Area 3 team uh, for that NREL team uh, that Tassos just mentioned. Um, and yeah, I'd like to just tell you a little bit today about our project uh, we call Summer Go. So um, we're, we're keeping these presentations pretty short. Uh, so I just want to give you a quick overview first of all the different things we did. Uh, we, we were developing better probabilistic forecasts. We were looking at how to utilize those forecasts in the economic dispatch timeframe, endogenously considering the uncertainty. We were looking how we could utilize those forecasts in updating 
uh, the amount of different types of reserves that were held in power system practice, and also in situational awareness for the utilities. Um, so we had a fantastic team here. I'd really like to highlight, you know, Maxar, the ones who are actually providing those forecasts for ERCOT in practice and operationally, um, and then as well, uh, UT Dallas, uh, who especially contributed to the uh, reserve work in particular. So looking at this, uh, you know, and the academic sort of mindset of the field beforehand, you know, probabilistic solar forecasting, when we started this project was a little bit behind wind forecasting. And so we really felt like we needed to be able to develop just really what the benchmark should be for a good probabilistic solar forecast. Um, you know, as you can see here, Things like climatology doesn't work as well for solar, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, you know, it, you, it, because of that strong diurnal pattern, you should be able to uh, figure out that the sun will rise tomorrow. Um, nevertheless, we compared with a lot of the different methods uh, that are available from the literature, as well as using as a basis of comparison, a sort of um, simple ensemble uh, from the 50 members of the ECMWF. And so uh, doing this, uh, we also developed some new methods based on uh, Bayesian model averaging to post-process those NWP models for the sort of day ahead timeframe. And, you know, found some pretty good results there in how those results perform, uh, you know, producing more reliable forecasts using that. Uh, so I think the key thing here that I just like to highlight is in particular the tail behavior. Uh, so we saw much better tail behavior. You can see sort of, um, when you look at this sort of PP plot uh, up in the bottom left corner and the upper right corner, um, you know, improved performance over the other methods and the, you know, raw ensemble, especially when it comes to the tail behavior, because these are really when, you know, the power system is going to be making tough decisions about whether to bring on new generation or whether to curtail something. We then translated all of this uh, with, and this is primarily Maxar, uh, I want to highlight into the operational practice. And so um, we went through and not only um, put this Bayesian model averaging approach in as a new algorithm, but Maxar also during this project expanded the number of ensemble members, you know, use, utilizing multiple updates of a number of the different models you can see here um, to expand out to about, you know, a 350 member or so ensemble. Uh, and also and here's some here's something that I think is a really key point, but overlooked, increasing the temporal fidelity of the forecast in the operational system in ERCOT. And so that may sound like a simple thing moving from, say, 60 minutes to five minutes or 15 minutes. But, you know, just in terms of data processing and working with the uh, utility um, energy management system, that is actually a very big deal. Um, so now producing higher fidelity forecasts at those time frames. And, just that alone, only that piece has been estimated by ERCOT to produce savings on the order of six to seven million dollars a year that are now being utilized operationally. Um, and just to look at that again, ERCOT was already doing sort of a 20th percentile forecast or an 80th percentile of exceedance, um, probability of exceedance rather. Um, but, you know, working as well and putting in the full sort of, uh, you know, percentile type distribution of forecasts at that higher resolution. So you can just see that resolutional difference between the left-hand side and the right-hand side over that time frame. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and I'd be happy to answer any questions after uh, the rest of the speakers. We'll go with uh, Aidan Tui next, uh, who comes from EPRI and manages the second or the third of the three uh, WKA3 projects. Uh, thanks, Tassas. Appreciate the opportunity to talk today. Um, yes, I, I led the, the team here, but a lot of the folks doing the work um, are, are listed here with a pretty large team at EPRI um, that, that you can see. We, we also worked with UL, um, Virginia Tech, and, and Polaris. Um, Again, very similar, I think, to, to how Brian described it. You know, we had folks doing improvements on forecasting. We had um, simulations to, to understand how we could use probabilistic forecasts in different ways. And then we 
had some kind of online demonstration tools as well. And so um, same kind of general concepts. We, we did this work with, with, with three utilities mostly, and we, we also did a small bit of work with, with uh, Cal ISO as well to, to, to demonstrate some of the methods. But uh, Duke Energy and Southern Company in the Southeast, the Duke Carolinas region, the full Southern Company footprint, um, and then Hawaiian Electric, who we'd already been working with and have been implementing some of the previous deterministic based methods that we had in place um, around reserve forecasting and um, extended that to see, well, if you bring probabilistic information in, what can you do? And so I uh, learned quite a few different things. Th these are kind of the key lessons. So just summarizing that. And then um, if I have time, I can get into to a couple of the more interesting results. But um, similarly, when we kind of looked at using a wider range of ensemble, using machine learning, um, that the UL probabilistic forecasts were improved uh, pretty significantly. Um, Tasso showed some of the results earlier, but um, compared to what they had been using before that, there was a pretty good improvement on the on the forecast for each of the regions we looked at, um, Southern Duke, Hawaii. Um, and the other piece there was, was really looking at how you take that probabilistic information and turn it into scenarios. So how, how that might actually play out using you know 50 different scenarios of how the day might play out. A lot of work with Virginia Tech on that to, um, to demonstrate that. And so there's kind of tools and code available now to, to be able to do that and use that in, in scheduling applications. Um, that was where we did a lot of the work in this. We, we built detailed models to, to model how you make decisions days, days ahead, week ahead, day ahead, down into real time for, um, for the utilities I mentioned, Southern Duke and, uh, and Hawaiian Electric. Um, and then looked at about five different methods. I don't have time today to go into all of them, but some of them used just the probabilistic information. Some of them used just historical information of deterministic forecasts, and some used hybrids and, and various measures of, of risk to um, mainly assess how much reserves you should be carrying in that day ahead to real time time frame. So to manage that uncertainty of solar for, for the Duke and um, Southern systems, because we were looking at the benefits, they have some solar now, and by now they have actually a lot of solar in both regions, but um, nowhere near what they're expecting in, in 10 years' time. So we looked at kind of these higher solar penetrations to see how much this methods can really help. A lot of when we're doing this, um, you certainly see savings that are significant in some regard. You get millions of dollars of savings, but you look at that as opposed when you kind of compare that to the overall cost of running the system, which is billions of dollars, that the cost savings can be you know, they're, they're in the order of 1% often. Um, <coughs> one of the other things we really see there was you really reduce the risk of running short on things like reserves or being able to supply balance supply and demand. So um, that's where we really see the value of it in terms of that kind of reliability. In some cases, we can, in some particular cases, when we looked at, say, higher future solar penetrations in some regions, we saw benefits in both where you can improve the reliability and improve the economic performance. In many cases, there's just a trade-off. You can improve the economics, but you maybe have some um, some reduction in reliability. You're more likely to run into risky situations, which obviously you don't want to do. So what these do allow you to do is tune that. Uh, and whereas in the past, we were saying, you know, this is your best forecast and we'll use that. This allows you to actually tune that in, in a way that's um, that's more informed by what your actual risk preferences are. The other thing that I noticed here, we, we were building this on an existing method that uh, Eric Gila, who I don't see in the audience right now, but he, he was talking about earlier in the tutorial where we forecast reserve requirements. That was built based on deterministic methods. That already was very good. And what we were seeing was that was already pretty hard to beat, partly because a lot of that, the, the methodology involved there uses some of the same re ways you develop probabilistic forecasts, look to historical data, you know, did regression analysis, that type of thing. And so it already does a pretty good job. And so there, there is some kind of discussion around it. Do we need to fully incorporate all of this method or can we kind of get by with some um, relatively simple, um, well, not simple, but with less data. And the last thing we did that, that David Larson actually just talked was the, one, the, the key developer on this was around a, a scheduling platform. So this again will be an open source tool up on the, the website listed here later in the summer um, to, calculate some of those methods, calculate some of the reserve requirements, show the probabilistic forecast, evaluate their performance, um, and it could be a useful thing to make available um, for folks after the project's finished. I'm just gonna skip through a couple of these slides relatively quickly. Um, this shows the, the, the improvements made. So you can see the kind of red versus the blue hair, um, that the new ignorance score was the, this, the metric we were using, which is kind of similar to some of the scores showed earlier on. Um, we saw pretty significant improvement in that as you just kind of use these new methods. Um, 
we did, as I said, kind of develop these different methodologies. I'm not going to go through this slide here, but, but had different ways based on historical observations or based on anticipated conditions. Some of these are very simple and you could just grab a probabilistic forecast that this is your reserve requirement. Some of them do require some, some detailed analysis. And so there's, again, there's kind of these trade-offs of how much time and effort you want to spend on getting the data in and, and doing the analysis versus kind of making relatively straightforward decisions. Typically though, when you do the more detailed analysis, you do of course get slightly better results. And we can kind of see that here. So there's, um, we do compare this, and this is actually for the, the Cal ISO system, um, worked with, with Amber and some folks there to, to look at some of these things and saw that, you know, there was benefit to using some of this risk-based methods when you're trying to calculate some of these flexibility reserve requirements. So happy to get into that in more detail, but that's kind of generally what we did. Um, yeah, I think this is already said. And this is kind of the key uh, case study results when we looked at some of the, the simulation methods. Um, you, you can see in the top right in particular that trade-off between reliability and costs that I, that I mentioned. If you, uh, you can reduce the amount of violations, reserve violations on the system, but it costs you. And we could kind of put a number on that and that, that allows operators to kind of consider what their risk preference is based on what they have on the system. You might have a bunch of demand response resources they could use to, to manage some of this, those types of things um, and get a sense of the kind of cost savings. Um, and then we did see in some cases, you can kind of see in the bottom room left here, there was some, some situations where you did actually have those cost and reliability savings at the same time. Um, and then the, the scheduling management platform, as I said, that chapter six in the report, but um, it's, a, it, it's a, a platform that we have uh, demonstrated with the, the particular operators. We worked with them to kind of get their preferences, what would make sense to them. This is in the context of, of three vertically integrated utilities. So they have a little bit of a different preference in terms of their looking at things like fuel purchases and uh, they have contracts and other things that they want to bring in. But the idea is that they should be able to use those to then kind of set what their reserve needs are and how they use the forecast to, um, to, to manage their operations. The other thing we did here that I didn't, didn't really mention was still a stochastic unit commitment analysis as well. So those who've been following this area, we, we didn't do a whole lot of effort Put a whole lot of effort into it, but we did try and test out some of the stochastic unit commit capabilities in the PSO tool. I really did show that there's some potential benefits around very risky conditions and being able to kind of operate robustly. But a lot of the methodology we showed really can capture that the kind of using probabilistic information to inform a reserve requirement and then running that reserve requirement in your traditional unit commitment and economic dispatch can get you most or all of the benefit of using a full kind of stochastic unit commitment. And in some cases we showed specific um, specific examples where it might actually do better than that. So that's kind of the, the high level learnings. We're gonna continue improving and, and there is that website available. Thank you, Aidan. And uh, last but not least, uh, we'll have uh, Ben Hobbs from Johns Hopkins University. Ben was the PI uh, for uh, the third of our uh, three topic area uh, projects. Topic area three projects. Great, uh, great. I hope you can hear me. We can. Uh, th that's terrific. Let's see if you can um, also see what uh, you want to see. So. Um... Tassos, thank you for uh, inviting me today. And of course, thanks to you and Acido uh, for supporting um, uh, the, the uh, Solar Forecasting 2 program that you've heard uh, supported Bry's project and Aiden's project, as well as ours. There are going to be some uh, familiar points made here um, um, in terms of using uh, probabilistic uh, forecasts to define requirements for operating reserves of, of various sorts, and then saving money as, as a result. And uh, actually very familiar because both Aiden and, and I thanked uh, Amber Motley for um, uh, her suggestions and data, and you're gonna be lucky enough, and I wish I would be there tomorrow morning to hear Amber speak uh, herself on some of these issues. Um, this is uh, a large team, um, IBM, uh, created probabilistic Watson. Uh, the University of Texas Dallas related the probabilistic forecast to um, uh, reserve requirements, as did uh, uh, my students at Johns Hopkins. And then NREL was re, uh, responsible for uh, visualizations and uh, for the production costing simulations. So here are those three parts, and I will go through each of these quickly. 
because I'm mindful, as my Iowa farmer relatives have told me, you never want to stand between the cattle and the barn at feeding time. And I know I'm the last presentation and there's a reception um, that's, that's soon to start. Um, so I'll, I'll go through probabilistic Watson very quickly, talk about the linkage that we made to two types of requirements. One is uh, for flexible ramp product. So we're interested in uncertainty and forecasting um, uh, uh, ramps in real time, and then area control error. And then finally, I'll talk about the production costing simulation, which was done using Eric Ella's model uh, Festive by NREL. So first probabilistic Watson in the solar forecasting one program, a deterministic version was, uh, was created that uh, used um, numerical uh, weather prediction models and Lagrangian models of, of cloud movement, integrating satellite data um, to estimate uh, GHI in the case of solar. Um, the estimates for different models were then blended with weights that depended on weather conditions and were identified by artificial intelligence methods. And finally, um, you got some forecasts and then these would be improved by machine learning as you proceed through time. Um, in solar forecasting two, this was enhanced uh, basically by replacing the relational big data bus with a non-relational key value store uh, called pairs, which basically increased by orders of magnitude the speed that data could be archived and retrieved and the amount of data that could be stored. And this is absolutely essential if you're gonna be using large ensembles and wanna get of, uh, models and get access to that data quickly. Um, we also um, uh, modified the Lagrangian models uh, to import GOES data and uh, to be uh, fully consistent with the physics um, uh, rather than partially. And then finally, the probabilistic forecasts. Um, so instead of the uh, medians, we got uh, full distributions based on a quantile regression. So this shows some of the speed up that we get in data access, um, one to three orders of magnitude, which then allow you to do uh, analyses and update your models one to three orders of magnitude more, more quickly. Um, using the GOZAR data, um, plus the probabilistic forecasting capabilities, we actually derive probabilistic forecasts on a rasterized basis. Click on the map and up comes the distribution. Um, of course, the real challenge is, well, what if you want to integrate over Southern California? You have to think about the correlations. The marginal distributions by themselves are, are not sufficient for doing what you want. So that's a topic for further research. And then finally, uh, um, a little deep dive here into the probabilistic aspects. Um, we use quantile regression within each weather characterization to come up with probabilistic forecasts. This shows probabilistic forecasts two hour ahead for two different days. And you can see that on a, a partially cloudy day, there's a lot more uncertainty than on a sunny day. This is the sort of thing that's produced. and um, these, uh, the Watson probabilistic model was found to do better um, based on the sort of PP plots that Fry showed, uh, for example, uh, found to do better than uh, baseline models in terms of calibration. Now, defining reserve requirements. Let's look at flexible ramp product first. And um, the goal of that is to preposition resources so you can meet unexpected ramps and in California um, and the uh, energy imbalance market that it runs, you're interested in picking off the 97th and half percentile, which is you know, a very high ramp, higher than expected. And then in the down direction, the sec uh, two and a half percentile. And so you're interested in trying to predict those. And those are the basis for um, uh, FRP requirements now. And as Amber may tell you tomorrow, uh, the ISO is interested in making their uh, ramp uh, requirements conditioned on weather and the amount of resources, solar and wind resources and load. Um, and the ISO is also planning to extend this from real time to day ahead. So why would you want to condition it on weather? I think comparing these two days tells you why. There's a lot more noise um, on a cloudy day in terms of 
uh, the net ramp from interval to interval in real time, whereas on a sunny day, there may be a lot less noise. The blue lines in these two plots are the requirements that are based on the present California ISO method, which is basically unconditional. It takes the last few weeks of forecast errors, builds a histogram, and picks off the tails. So you see there's not much difference in the requirements between August 7th and August 12th, but there's an awful lot of difference in terms of the amount of uncertainty and ramp. So it makes sense to perhaps procure more on days like this and procure less on days like this, saving money and making the system um, uh, uh, making the system less likely to have a, re, uh, a ramp shortage. Uh, we use quantile regression and uh, Keith Neer's neighbor um, using data from five sites in California um, and uh, proximity of different days. The distance calculation was based on variables for both GHI and um, the resulting power and the uncertainty, the width of the prediction intervals for those quantities. Furthermore, we looked at how the forecast change, uh, the average forecast over the day, uh, how it changes over the day, and then the volatility from period to period, and try to use the resulting 12 variables to predict how much um, ramp would be need. Needed. So Aiden showed a plot a little bit like this is a trade off plot, which shows the probability of shortage versus uh, the amount of oversupply. The, um, uh, the, the bullseye here, the red lines show uh, the baseline histogram method that the California ISO uses. And so if you can move to the southwest, you're doing better. And so our analysis showed that many of the KNN models could do better, um, uh, depending which variables you use. And in fact, if you use multiple sites and uh, use a principal component analysis to combine the variables, you do even better. So these stars here on the uh, left, which have about 30% less uh, oversupply of FRP and uh, slightly higher reliability, those are the ones that we then simulate using uh, Eric Ella's uh, festive model. We also looked at regulation. So presently, regulation requirements are, day, are, are set day ahead and may be adjusted in real time by the operators. Those are the purple lines here for seven day period. Uh, we suggested, well, what if you could forecast a star a, uh, adjusted by the amount of regulation an hour ahead or two hours ahead and then when you see a large A star coming, you could get more uh, regulation up or regulation down. Those are the orange lines. And once again, we're able to uh, lower the amount that you procure, of reg in this case of regulation, and without deteriorating reliability. And so um, this looks, using solar forecasts, for example, um, and time series methods to refine uh, regulation requirements looks promising as a way to perhaps lower the cost of regulation, but while maintaining or improving uh, the ability to meet uh, the uh, A star that you need to meet. And if you can so, wrap up. Okay, um, so I'll jump right to the production costing simulation of um, the new FRP requirements with the Keith nearest neighbor versus the baseline histogram method and we'll look at system production cost and total uh, procurement cost. So, so this shows the two sets of requirements. Orange are the new requirements, sometimes higher. For example, more down uh, flex down uh, in the morning and more flex up in the evening. And sometimes there are less in the middle of the day in the case of flex down for this particular time in March. So um, when you have less requirements, then you're saving on committing units. When you have more requirements, you might suppress price spikes and reduce the amount of um, curtailment of renewables. And so using the production costing simulation, we actually see uh, uh, estimated what that, uh, how much savings would occur uh, for those reasons. And we found that for this eight day period in March, 2020, uh, production costs were reduced by about a half a percent, which over the course of a year, if you believe you could extrapolate this, would amount to 
40 or 50 million dollars per year for the California ISO system, more now because of course gas prices are higher, and the procurement costs for FRP uh, diminished by 30%, which would amount to some handful of uh, millions of dollars uh, presently, and perhaps more in the future as the flexible ramp uh, product is uh, uh, refined and improved. Um, we recognize that extrapolating from eight days to 365 days or multiple years is um, uh, perhaps laughably um, uh, heroic, but this is a start and future research we hope will uh, get better estimates. So to summarize, we think probabilistic solar forecasts, and I, I, I think we uh, agree with Bry and Aiden in this, are a highly promising way to condition reserve requirements on up-to-date weather conditions. So thanks very much for the support, Tassos, and thanks very much to the audience for listening. Thank you, Ben. Right.